Very good morning to you and thanks for joining us on The Breakfast. My name is Nyamgul Agaji. Welcome to the second day of the second half of this year, 2024. Uh, it's a wonderful day and as we always say, the most important day in your life is today. Not tomorrow, not yesterday, it's today. So let's make the best use of today as it is. Uh, we're going to have on the program very interesting topics to discuss. Uh, the first one is going to be the federal government faces scrutiny over controversial multi-budget implementation. We also are going to be discussing the fact that the court has dismissed Namdi Kanu's one billionaire suit against federal government. There will be off the press where we lift some uh, headlines from some of our national dailies, uh, what are those headlines that made it to the front pages of our national dailies? And then there will be top trending issues as well. And these top trending issues are issues that caught our attention in the course of the last 24 hours. You might have your own top trending, but this ones will be ours. But before we do that, let's set the tone rightly by just uh, taking the quote for the day. The technologies which have had the most profound effects on human life are usually simple. The technologies which have had the most profound effects on human life are usually simple. That's according to Freeman Dyson. And this is so true. Um, it doesn't have to be complex. It doesn't have to be complicated for it to be very important uh, to human life and, you know, helping you become better, helping you have a better life and all that. I usually say uh, one of the best inventions, if not the best invention, was the matchstick. It was not the light tie, it was not the light bulb, it was not anything else. The thing that had the most profound uh, effect on human life was when the matchstick was invented. Just imagine what life was before the matchstick came. And you see a lot of things that if you go to transportation, for instance, the one that has had the most effect on human life may not be aeroplane, it may just be a simple car. Uh, it may just be a, a bicycle. When the bicycle was invented, how many people did it affect? Now that we have aeroplane, how many people take the aeroplane? Yeah. So these are just examples I'm giving. Like someone said, the best things in life are free. So it doesn't have to be very complex. That is how it is in every aspect of our lives. When you t do not take note of the simple things of life, you find out at the end of the day that you may have just wasted your life pursuing the things that you felt were the big ones, leaving the simple ones that will really make meaning to your life when you combine all of them together. It is the small steps that you take that make you great, not the great st steps that you take that could make you fall. Okay, so we're just going to go straight to the top trending issues this morning. We're starting with the fact that Katsina State Governor Diko Umar Rada has committed to leading efforts against malnutrition in northern Nigeria particularly in Katsina State. At a high-level dialogue in Abuja, hosted by the Athena Center for Policy and Leadership and the Federal Minister of Health, rather highlighted the urgent need to address the crisis affecting over 10 million children. He emphasized the devastating impact of malnutrition on children and families in the region, calling for immediate and sustained action. The event included key stakeholders such as governors and federal minister, ministers and rather advocated for a shift in federal allocations to address the increased insecurity and vulnerability to malnutrition in the northwest and north central regions. Uh, I do hope that the governor knows that it goes beyond providing just food for the people. 
if there is malnutrition in the north, it will mean that there are some other factors that are contributing to this malnutrition, the, the unavailability of food for the people that need it. One of them is population. And how does population come about? It's not just because uh, the people like to procreate. It starts from the fact that the people are not educated enough. So everything is connected. Uh, when people are educated and their minds are occupied with something different from uh, just uh, uh, making babies, the population reduces to a quality population rather than a population of quantity. That is what it is. So, and then if it also goes beyond just having children, when a culture uh, um, encourages people to go out to beg and not to do any other thing that will bring food to their table apart from begging, you will see that there's also a problem there. So if this cultural shift can be done, if this education can be given to a lot of people, uh, if so many other things are put in place, then we'll find out that malnutrition will give way to something really, really good. It's not enough to just provide the grains for the people. How many people can you feed with? How many bags of rice? Or how much money do you intend to budget to a people uh, that do not care about um, population control or bed control? People who do not care about having something wholesome to do, but just to go on the streets to beg. There are people up north uh, from stories um, that uh, have their children and they see it as a culture that once a child gets to a particular age, they're sent into the street with a plate uh, to go and start begging and all that. And then how do you remove malnutrition from a, a population of this nature? How do you remove mal malnutrition from a population that is more than the food that they're supposed to eat? And you cannot say um, anybody who is, is, is making babies, you have to stop and all that. The things you see, the things that comfort them are different from the these things that comfort you. So it starts with education. And if we cannot give education to our people, then they will just have themselves alone and think about nothing but what they are thinking about now that is making the population to grow that much. So it goes beyond grains. Like I said, it goes beyond money. Uh, we hope that the governor will look at, at this issue holistically and make sure that uh, whatever leads to malnutrition, not just the absence of food, will be addressed so that uh, this will be a thing of the past. But at least someone has made a pronouncement and he's working towards that. Whatever he's going to do, they, he's going to correct the mistakes uh, that he will make along the line and we hope that everybody else will borrow a leaf from that and make sure that our children are well taken care of, that they have food to eat. Right now, malnutrition is not just for the children. I'm sure a lot of adults now are facing it because of the situation we find ourselves in Nigeria. No matter how much we tell ourselves a lie, it cannot make it the truth. We are suffering in Nigeria. And the average person who could have ordinarily a few years ago been a helping hand to someone else is now needing help. So uh, what, how do you explain that? So we need to all put our hands together to make sure that we provide for ourselves as best we can and at least comfort ourselves as best we can. We'll take another one. The second uh, top trending story here is that an Ikeja High Court has ordered the release of Kazima Deshino after he spent 15 years in a correctional facility without charge or trial. Justice Oyindamola Ogala ruled that Adeshino's detention was illegal and gross violation of his fundamental human rights as outlined in the Nigerian Constitution and the African Charter on Human and People's Rights. The court emphasized the importance of the presumption of innocence and criticized the failure of authorities to bring Adeshino to trial, despite correspondence indicating he should have been transferred for arraignment since 2003. The judge ordered Adeshino's immediate and unconditional release and acknowledged that no valid reason justified his continued detention. I don't know, 15 years, 2003 to 2013 is 10 years, and then to 2023 uh, is 20 years, 2024 is 21 years. So I don't know the, pro the, the, the time that uh, gave them 15 years. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, if my maths is correct, that's 21 years that someone was supposed to be arraigned and wasn't and has stayed in custody. So let's just say it is the 15 years that are, has officially been given. Uh, why, how can someone stay in custody without arraignment 
awaiting trial matters for 15 years. And this is someone who could afford a lawyer at the end of the day that spoke for him. There are people in detention that have stayed, that have stayed more than that, those 15 years or maybe 20 years and they have not gone to court. It's not that they've been convicted. And we've been saying it on this show, uh, our experiences uh, when we're talking about prisons in Nigeria and what the people in the prisons do, what the authorities do, what the police does and all that. And it is really, really worrisome. How can someone stay? Maybe he's even innocent. He stays there in custody and then nobody even thinks about him for 15 good years. 15. 15 years out of everybody's, anybody's life is a wasted 15 years. You are staying in custody for maybe even a crime that you know nothing about. We know of people who have been arrested just because they were walking on the street at night. You never know where that person is coming from, what happened to the person that made him come back at that time. Maybe he was working late or maybe he lost his transport money or one thing or the other. And then you just take them, take them to the... Um, to the prison and they are thrown there. Nobody remembers them. Some of them, the family members, do not even know where they are. There's no way of communicating with people outside. They don't know a number to call, they don't know anything, and they stay there. Even if this person committed a crime or the person is innocent and you leave that person for 15 years, how much of the events will the person remember when he's testifying in court? Maybe some of these things will be foggy and then you find him guilty over things that he could have, he could have, a story that he could have told better if you had arraigned him early enough for him to remember all the facts. Well, you know, we leave them there and the justice system is allowing this. And we think the, whoever is concerned should sit up and make sure that people who should not be in prison are not in prison. And those who should be in prison are in prison. Uh, some people are roaming free even uh, on the streets, even when they are supposed to be guilty and sentenced to prison. They are roaming free. And there's other ones who are maybe innocent or maybe who committed a crime that normally could have, could have taken like uh, six months imprisonment, will be in custody for 10, 20 years and all that. And then when these people come out, knowing that the system had failed them, what kind of people do you think they will be? I think at this point, we should try to fish out the people who are responsible for things like this so that they get to pay. If someone stays in prison and he's there for 20 years and he's innocent, or whether he's innocent or not, he's not being tried, when he comes out, can he sue someone? And if he can sue someone, who will he sue? Will it be the police that put him there? Will it be the judges? Will it be the prison um, warders? Who will he sue? People should start uh, facing the music for bad behavior. And a lot of these people who are thrown there are thrown there by the people who just don't like them because they have the power. We told a story here once how somebody was arrested because his father was... Uh, he because he took something from a son of a policeman and it was justifiably taken, but he was just taken, thrown in jail in faraway Abuja and his parents, his family here in Lagos, didn't know where he went to. And everybody thought he was kidnapped and he was killed and they did his um, obituary, there was a burial and all that without the cops. And then only to find out years later that he was in Abuja because people went for evangelism and he was able to sneak a number into the hands of one of the evangelizers. Things like this happen. You feel it's like a movie. It is not. But we hope that we'll get to a point where it never happens and we hope that it never happens to you if you're watching right now. Now, the Minister of Works, Senator David Omahi, announced that the ministry will not pay variations of price, VOP, on any new road projects, deeming it fraudulent. Umahi criticized contractors for using VOP to delay projects completion and stated that those unable to meet project uh, requirements should cease working. Speaking in Calabar during a stakeholders meeting on the Lagos Calabar Coastal Road, Umahi highlighted new policies for better project supervision, including directing ministry directors to relocate to sites and send daily reports. He emphasized that VOP payments will be halted as they have 
been identified as a method of fraud hindering pro projects progress. I, I think this is a very, very interesting one, a very, very, very lofty one. Let the directors relocate to where the projects are and supervise and give daily reports. What have, has brought a lot of anomalies in our system is the fact that there's no supervision and it, you don't expect the minister to go to every project that is happening everywhere when there are directors there. So directors go there, give daily reports and let's see what happens. And it could be true, uh, I think it definitely is true, you have a contract of a hundred million, you delay the contract, you were given six, six months to complete the project, you delay it and it gets to one year and you come back and say that things have gone up, the project is now something else, so money should be added and then they add money to you. So if it was supposed to be a hundred million, the federal government ends up uh, paying maybe 200 million or so for something that you accepted, you said you were capable of finishing within six months and you got there and you couldn't do it. You didn't complain until it got to too late, the time that it was too late and then you came back and said uh, for this project to be completed something has to be added to me and all that. So Devo Mahi, uh, thumbs up for you. We do hope that your directors will, uh, will do what you have asked them to do and not use the Nigerian factor and just, like we say, die the matter. We hope that um, this Calabar, uh, Lagos Calabar Coastal Road will be completed uh, on schedule because if it is not and it is used as a campaign strategy for the 2027 election, Nigerians will not like it. So far, we like the work that you are doing. We like the work uh, a lot of other ministers are doing. We hope that they will continue. For those ministers that we do not even know their names anymore because they may not, uh, they seem to be too silent and not working. We hope that you are going to sit up or we call on the federal government, replace them if they cannot do what they were asked to do, they were selected to do. If they can, cannot do it, replace them with people who are competent enough to do it because this is not the time for experiments, this is not the time to learn on the job. It's either you know how to do it or you don't. Uh, we don't want a Kenya experience to come to Nigeria. Okay, uh, that's that uh, for the um, top trending issues. We're going to take a short break, look at the weather, and when we return, we'll be looking at the headlines. Stay with us. <music>